So hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I would like to officially welcome you to the seventh webinar in this series. The webinar series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada and the New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund. We're very fortunate to be hosting two speakers for today's presentation on barriers to fish passage. Todd Dupuy will be giving the first presentation with a focus on the issue of culverts. Todd is the Executive Director of the Regional Program with the Atlantic Salmon Federation and is based on Prince Edward Island. The second presentation will be given by Fred Parsons with a focus on some of the issues associated with dams and downstream fish passage. Fred is the General Manager of the Environmental Resources Management Association, or IRMA, on the Exploits River in Newfoundland. Due to the fact that we have two guest speakers for today's presentation, we'll likely run a little bit longer than our usual 45 minutes. If you're unable to remain for the full webinar, please remember that we do post recordings of all of our webinar presentations on the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation website after the event has taken place. So just before we get started, a couple of housekeeping matters for those of you that are new to the webinar series. We'll save questions until the end of both presentations. Um, ask a question, you can our control panel, that's the little gray box you'll see up in the top corner of your screen. If the box is minimized, you hit the orange arrow to enlarge it. You can use the audio of your computer to uh, and raise your hand and then speak directly. Um, to raise your hand, it's the yellow icon with the green arrow and then we'll unmute you and you can ask your question directly using the audio of your computer. Or you also have the option of typing in your, your question on the control panel and we'll read it aloud for you during the question and answer session. Finally, if none of those options are working for you, perhaps you're on, on a telephone connection, you can also email me questions directly and I'll read them aloud for you. And my email address again is darla, D-A-R-L-A, at salmonconservation.ca. So I will now turn things over to our first speaker, Todd. Great. Uh, thanks, thanks, Darla and Michelle, for, for hosting this. Uh, like Darla said, my name is uh, Todd Dupuy. I am the Executive Director of Regional Programs Canada for the Atlantic Salmon Federation. And I'm going to talk to you folks today about, uh, about roadway culverts. Um, I have about 20 years' experience in, in watershed restoration and uh, been focusing uh, much of my time as of the last decade or so and trying to get fish up through culverts. Uh, in roadways. So I have about 25 slides. Uh, it'll be fast, it'll be general, uh, but uh, knowing that, that you'll have an opportunity, if you don't have uh, an opportunity to ask questions today, that my contact information will be forwarded to you and you can contact me at a later, at a later date. So off we go. Uh, obviously uh, a problem with culverts here. We're going to look at uh, four specific problems uh, that, uh, that I see as the most common with respect to fish passage in, in culverts. And uh, the first one being uh, what we call a hung culvert or a perch culvert. Those are the culverts that have the, the exiting end of the culvert that are they're, they're hung up high and which uh, causes a waterfall on the downstream side. We're going to talk about high velocity barriers or where the water is uh, running very fast through the culvert. Talk about uh, shallow water problems. A lot of these culverts, uh, especially these false bottom culverts that are, have a wooden bottom or a concrete bottom, have these uh, what we call inadequate water depth problems, where the water is only a, you know, a number of centimeters uh, deep, which is uh, very unnatural. And, a and if you're looking at uh, wooden floors, which I do uh, here on PEI, a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, culverts are old tree soap types with the, with a wooden floor, and and uh, we've had some problems with these uh, floors that rot out after uh, you know three or four decades. So the first one we're going to look at, of course, is, is perch culvert. A, a very common problem. This is uh, an extreme example that we see here. This is you know, six or seven feet high. Uh, certainly, uh, if you have a culvert uh, that looks like this, you're not getting any fish. I don't know of any fish in the world that would get up through this. Uh, extreme example, uh, but even, even the smaller uh, culverts uh, that are perched can cause problems. So this is a, um, a wooden creosote uh, structure with a, uh, with a wooden floor. And, uh, you know, the... Um, the drop is only, I think, if I remember correctly, about 35 or 40 centimeters, which is, isn't very big. You'll likely get adult Atlantic salmon up through there, but other fishes like uh, brook trout or you know, rainbow smelt or, or a gaspro species uh, would have uh, trouble uh, negotiating even a, a waterfall of this of the size. And if this uh, culvert is close to the head of tide and you have these anadromous fishes trying to get to the spawning grounds and you've got, uh, you may have some problems. 
Uh, velocity barriers. Uh, this is a video, actually, and I have, uh, I must say, four or five videos that I, short little clips that I want to show, but the, the system is not working perfectly, and, and what I see in my screen is a very smooth running video. What you will see is a very choppy video. Uh, so I've elected not to run uh, videos other than this one here. I think it's important just to see this one. And this is a, a culvert not fair from where I live from PDI, and it's it, and I'll run it, and you will see. Uh, of course, I hear the noise, but you do not. So I'm hoping that has stopped. And what we see here is there's two issues. Of course, the water, the uh, the culvert is has very shallow water, and you've got uh, a culvert that that's a number of feet long with a uh, very fast uh, fast flowing water, and a lot of fish uh, that uh, that that encounter this cannot negotiate uh, what we call a velocity barrier. I equate that to if you're running up an escalator and the escalator is two kilometers long and if you're in good, good condition you may get halfway up and you tire out then you, and you have to turn around to go back down. It's the same with some of these fish. Uh, they, just, they don't have the swimming ability uh, to get up through these long culverts if they're, uh, if they're uh, if the water is very fast, fish uh, fish negotiate fast water in in, in river systems uh, because often uh, this fast water is associated with uh, with with boulders and and uh, these boulders actually create these uh, unique hydraulic conditions where the water actually goes around the boulder and comes back back up on either side and you get these areas of dead areas here or actually water moving upstream and and that's how really fish negotiate. Uh, these uh, these fast water systems. When you look at a system like this here, uh, at any given point, maybe 20 to 25 percent of the water is actually moving upstream uh, because of these weird uh, hydraulic conditions that, that move around rocks. And that's how fish negotiate these uh, these fast flowing uh, systems. And a culvert, of course, there are no breaks in the in, in the system, and uh, these fish have not uh, cannot have a difficult time negotiating uh, these uh, these systems. So velocity barriers quite common. Often these culverts are uh, are hydraulically undersized. These these culverts often are you know three or four decades old, and they were it was little consideration given to them for fresh passage when they were installed. They were installed mostly uh, to uh, to allow for a, a you know a rainstorm event uh, of a, maybe a one in fifty year event to allow the uh, water to uh, to come under the road without washing the road out. There was little consideration given to fish at the time, and unfortunately, a lot of these culverts are still around and and they're still fun and the cost of replacing them are, are, is very expensive and uh, and often governments uh, you know, these government roads often uh, they're a little reluctant to replace them until they do collapse there's another video here which I won't show but this is a uh, again a culvert uh, very close to my place and on the on the left side these are uh, what we call rainbow smelts uh, and folks that are chiming in here from Atlanta, Canada, would, most of you would know what those are. And these are anadromous fish that come in from salt water to do their spawning in the fresh water. They come in large numbers. Uh, they don't go very far into the watershed, you know, for 5 or 10 or 15 kilometers, uh, but they still need to get into fresh water to do their spawning. And this culvert is actually only 3 or 4 kilometers uh, above the head of tide. And uh, so these fish are trying to get up through this culvert, and, and, and this, this is a very small road, I and mean, that culvert wouldn't be any more than 30 feet long. Yet that uh, issue there with, uh, with the water coming through is enough to stop these smelts, and you don't see any smelts above this culvert, you don't see any eggs above these culvert. And these, uh, th these are great indicators. If, you're, you know, if you live in Atlanta, Canada, you have this species, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's a good time to walk the watershed uh, when this smelt run is on to determine if uh, these fish are actually uh, able to negotiate, negotiate uh, getting through these culverts. And if they don't, then you would, of course, mark that down and uh, for that culvert to be uh, repaired or, or, or replaced. Uh, shallow water uh, systems, uh, culverts, like you see here, another video which I won't show, but I mean, you can see here that, that water is only three or four centimeters uh, deep and uh, you know fish need to be able to grip the water so you may be able to get fish over the top of this uh, little waterfalls here but once you get into the culvert they just say they, they cannot negotiate it because the water is uh, is so uniform uniformly shallow and in natural uh, river systems you don't see that uh, you've got a, usually a rough bottom uh, composed of uh, rock and boulders that uh, that make the water quite a bit deeper and uh, and as such, the fish are able to negotiate. But a system like this with, uh, with no breaks uh, in the current and with the shallow water are also a problem. And this is the same culvert and it's actually uh, you know, so shallow that it's actually uh, dry, drying up in the middle here. And what's happened, of course, you get the water focusing down each side of the culvert. Uh, so you've got two problems. You've got a water velocity problem. 
and you've got a water a water depth problem. So this is very difficult uh, difficult for uh, to fish to to negotiate. Rotted floors. I don't know from you folks in the other uh, part of the part of the country here, but this is a you know, big problem in PEI. These these floors last usually three decades, and uh, they tend to rot out. When they do rot out, of course, the water falls down through the culvert, and uh, it can cause uh, it can cause some real problems. If you look very closely, you'll see that again we're talking about rainbow smelts. This whole area is right full of rainbow smelts. There are thousands of them that are no stuff against the culvert, and for obvious reasons, uh, they cannot get through the culvert. So this is another problem. And, uh, that we see in PEI, these old corporates often have to have their floors uh, floors replaced. So we'll go right into some so some of these uh, solutions for some of the culverts. So the first one we're going to look at is is the perch culvert uh, or the hung culvert. And uh, one of the solutions that that we're using in PEI is is actually creating what we call riffles or, uh, down below the culvert where we have small little dams. Uh, and what we do is we break up that waterfall instead of a waterfall that may be too high for fish to negotiate, we break it up into smaller little chunks, little jumps, maybe six inches high, and, and most of the fish that we find in PEI can actually negotiate a, you know, a lift of maybe 15 centimeters. Uh, and I'll show you some examples here. So we've got a, a perch culvert here. It's not very high. Maybe if it's close to the head of tide, it may be uh, an issue with uh, with rainbow smells. And what we do is we, uh, we tend to call these little riffle systems. So we have uh, you know a series of little waterfalls as opposed to one big waterfall. Here's an example, another video, video I won't run, but this is, it, it isn't a very big uh, waterfall, but it certainly was, was blocking uh, rainbow smells from getting up into the system. And what we did was we, we built a riffle system here uh, with rock. Um, I like them uh, because they look very natural. Uh, you know, they, they look simple, but they, they have to be designed correctly. And you can notice how these stone are here. These are, these are big stones, are 250 and then uh, there's and also they have smaller stones uh, that are 10 and are 5 you see here will help help you know force the water to be impounded and you see the water is impounded right there it's impounded about 6 inches and we have two of these structures this is a, a completed one here there's another one you don't see in the just down below and there's a, a before and after shot of the culvert so we've been we've uh, you know got rid of that waterfall we know that fish are now getting up through there these systems if they're uh, if they're uh, designed correctly will not move and these are these are build and leave them alone systems uh, you have to follow certain hydraulic uh, rules with respect to sizing rock and what have you but if you build them correctly uh, they, they they don't move even in you know the biggest of floods so we like them because they look natural and because uh, they're pretty low maintenance after they're built this is a not a culvert, but this is a uh, a dam that uh, on a small river here on PEI, remnants of an old dam, and it had about a three or four, or maybe maybe more than that, four foot uh, uh, drop of water. There's still a pond, a man-made uh, impoundment up here, and the landowner, uh, you know, it was, this is obviously causing problems. It was a kilometer from the head of tide. It was blocking everything from getting up into the spawning grounds, except for perhaps you know Atlantic salmon. Uh, but there was Gasparilla species, there were uh, rainbow, spout, rainbow trout and, uh, and, and brook trout, what have you. They were having problems getting up through there. The landowner uh, didn't want to uh, uh, remove the, uh, the dam because he wanted to uh, keep the pond on, on his property. So we, we negotiated uh, removing the dam and building a number of these riffles. And you see there's four or five of them here. So instead of one big fall of water, we've got five or six of these here. And there's another shot of it here looking downstream. So the old dam site was down here. And what we ended up uh, building was... Uh, Five or six of these uh, these structures, so you've got uh, you know 15 centimeter drop as you go down, and as a result provides a pretty good fish passage. In fact, this is a shot at the very top of the riffle, way up here, where the pond is, and these are these are rainbow smelts uh, that have uh, negotiated, which are the weakest of the week when it comes to PEI. Of all the adventurous fishes that we see, uh, these rainbow smelts are, are are the weakest, and we know if we get rainbow smelts up into the system that we don't have to worry about uh, you know the, the sum on it. Uh, you know the brook trout, Atlantic salmon, and gaspro species. So we aim, we aim to get uh, you know all the uh, the fish that are anadromous up into the spawning grounds. Uh, even though your interest may be uh, in Atlantic salmon or brook trout, is important to uh, to make sure that all these fishes get get access because they do uh, contribute to the health health of the watershed uh, in the long run. Solutions for high velocity culverts uh, certainly uh, baffling. It's it's quite common, and uh, you know it's basically what you're doing is you're, you're uh, putting uh, timber uh, timbers down in place, which breaks up the current. They act like rocks. 
uh, and you get these uh, funky uh, back eddies here, which uh, which uh, help these uh, fish get up through the through the structure. I, some people uh, I have used boulders. I have not done this, uh, like you see in the bottom left hand side. Uh, um, I don't know how uh, how well it's worked. I have not uh, done this, but apparently, if they're sized correctly, then they may uh, provide some some passage or, uh, for for fish up through uh, culverts, like you see here. Another shot of a, of, of a baffle culvert. This one, of course, is more common in PEI, which is the angled the angled uh, structure. And basically, what it is is a fish ladder that's laid down flat. And Fred will talk about fish ladders a little later. But basically, that's what it is. It's just basically a fish ladder is laid down flat on on the on the bottom of the culvert. Well, the solution is uh, obvious for for rotted floors is 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 to re, is to replace the uh, the floor with with new timbers. Um, and of course, uh, once you do that, you now have to go a little further and 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 resolve any any water depth problems uh, by baffling and water velocity problems uh, by baffling. Uh, this is the uh, a culvert that I, I showed you earlier with the smelts. So uh, they were there was a velocity barrier issue and this is this is the culvert downstream and this is a culvert upstream. So if you go up over the road and you walk onto the other side, this is what you see. There are two culverts here. One is completely collapsed. You see it here, it's been collapsed and as a result all the water is running through one culvert and out the other side. Uh, so that was the issue. Uh, this culvert over here wasn't providing any flow. So the solution was to replace the culverts, and we, and we did put uh, two culverts in, which were a little bigger than the ones here. And in fact, the smelts are now getting up into this, uh, to the upper reaches of the spotting ground for uh, for the first time in, in probably 50 years. Uh, Maine uh, has really, really taken uh, this fish passage issue on. Uh, my colleagues down there are. are has a, have a fairly fairly extensive program on, on the Penobscot River where they are dealing with some of these uh, culvert issues, and uh, often instead of uh, replacing a culvert with a culvert, they uh, they try a, you know to replace a culvert with a bridge, which in my mind is the best solution because you end up with a natural bottom system, uh, like you see here, and 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 there's nothing better for passage than, than a natural bottom system. Uh, loss causes. No one to cut your uh, cut your losses. You know, when you look at a culvert like this, I mean, there's, you're not going to do anything to resolve this issue other than, than to re, to uh, to replace that culvert. Here's a here's a, a private uh, private culvert over here, and uh, it's obviously undersized. You see, well, the top of the road is actually being eroded, so in high water flow, it's going over top of the road, and I suspect that thing has eroded out a number of times, and they you know, often just Sort of drag the culvert back and put more fill on it. That's a lost cost too. Yeah, you uh, you really should look at the option of, of replacing those culverts uh, uh, with a with a better one or or, uh, or with a bridge. Culvert designs the cheapest to build, uh, of course, are the uh, are these ones here. Uh, the corrugated round ones. Governments love them because they're very cheap. Uh, but unfortunately, they're the worst uh, when it comes to fish passage. These ones here are better. These ones have a false bottom. Would be either a, a concrete bottom or a, or a Wooden bottom, at least with with flat bottom, you, you have options to baffle or to put stone in there. The, but the best ones are the are the natural bottom ones, like you see here, where you have a footing on either side of the stream. You don't touch the stream; you just leave it at, uh, leave it be, and you end up with a uh, cover that looks something like this here, which is a fairly new one here in PEI. So you don't really uh, mess around with the uh, with the uh, substrate at all. You just allow the, the river to run through, and and these things are always better uh, with respect to passing fish. Some of the new systems. Uh, have prefab uh, uh, baffles built in. This is a concrete uh, system with concrete baffles, and uh, and I, I noticed a number of those in New Brunswick when they built the they turned the highway in New Brunswick. Um, they were putting some of these systems in, and you know they're not bad. They're still a false bottom. I would prefer to have a, a you know a natural bottom uh, system uh, relative to this, but they do uh, are somewhat effective at passing fish. So to wrap up, uh, the key features to look at for a good road crossing, uh, those being uh, use natural subject within the crossing. So we look, you see here, we have two, uh, two uh, a bridge and a culvert. We have uh, boulders and and you know big substrate, and it looks natural. And uh, there's no better fist passage than uh, than uh, you know uh, just a natural river running under underneath the structure. Uh, certainly match the natural water depth and velocities. You want to make sure the culvert's not uh, too steep, uh, unnaturally steep. It's going to cause water water velocity uh, barriers. Uh, so you, you, want to make, you want to make sure that it matches the, the, what the river is, you know, upstream of the structure that you're trying to repair. Uh, and the structure should be at least 1.2 times natural bank width. It's well, 
full bank with. So, you know, we may install it in the summertime, but remember that in the spring and and high and you know in high flow events that uh, it's going to be able to take uh, take that flow. And uh, most most new structures that are being put in are put in a bank full width, which is a, what we consider to be one one point two times the natural bank width. If you do that, you're 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 pretty much guaranteed that uh, you've got a fairly natural system that that's uh, running under the structure and you provide uh, reasonable passage uh, for fish. And lastly, bridges and open bottom columns are the best. There's no doubt about it. I mean, these, these uh, unnatural you know, wooden bottom structures or culvert bottom structures are always problematic in my mind. And I think if you, know, if you, have, if you have the option, then you should strive for these natural bottom systems like you see here because nothing provides, uh, provides better passage. That's it for me. And uh, I think there's going to be questions at the end of the next presentation. If not, uh, then uh, my contact information will be forwarded to you and, be, and feel free to contact me at a later date. Great. Thank you very much, Todd. That was excellent, really informative. Um, so now we'll turn things over to Fred. Fred, are you ready to go? Yep, I think I'm ready to go. Um, okay. Uh, uh, it, I'm on. Yes. Okay. All right. So we're just in the process of turning control of the screen over to Fred. Um, okay. Show my. Uh, have you got me up there now? Uh, no, not yet. You need to click yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now we can yeah, see I'm... your screen. Yep. Perfect. Oh, oh. Okay then. Um, are you getting in a mess that I'm getting here, or are you just getting to one slide? Okay, I'm okay. You, okay, you got the first slide up there, no problems. Yeah, we're seeing the double again. We're seeing the smaller one again, but that's all right. It'll work. Okay, then I'll I'll take it from that rather than get into it. Uh, morning, folks. Uh, we, we've talked. Uh, 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 Um, Fred, we're getting some problems with uh, your voice. Fred? Fred, I don't know. Can you hear me? Uh, your voice is coming through very choppy. I don't know if you need to adjust the position of your microphone. Okay, no, I've got it all, uh, but you were very choppy to me then, too. Oh, okay. So no, you're I'm sounding much sure clearer now. If, uh, Okay. Okay. It seems, uh, seems I just changed. I just made a little adjustment in the slides, and okay. so you're doing okay there now. Yep. No, you sound good Let's now. See. Okay. Okay, so uh, we'll start again. Uh, uh, like I say, I, I, so I'm going to talk about probably some bigger, bigger fish passage uh, systems uh, that, uh, uh, and more particularly, like like was mentioned, uh, I have been. Uh, now my slides don't want to advance. Okay, there we go. Uh, I have been involved on the Exploits River for, for the last 28 years, and this is a, a very large system, some 12,000 square kilometers um, uh, of, of drainage area. And if you go back into the late 70s, we had about, uh, about probably 12, 1,300 fish, and to these days uh, we're, we're coming, coming close to 50,000 returning Atlantic salmon. Uh, and a, a lot of this uh, certainly uh, was true fish passage uh, requirements. Uh, just to look at it first, we say, well, you know, when would you, when would fish passage be required? And uh, when you look at the, the larger ones, uh, it could very well be to uh, to open up new habitats above uh, above the obstructions. Uh, Newfoundland is uh, very unique, I guess, in our land formations uh, that it's uh, it's very rough, it's very uh, hilly, and our and our rivers tend to be very fast moving uh, waterways. Uh, so it, it certainly do present uh, some some challenges. Uh, in our particular area, and pretty well all over Newfoundland, there was an history of uh, log driving. Uh, we used to have about three paper mills. I think we got a half of one left, and a lot of these were around uh, from uh, the, the early 1900s. And uh, when the practice of today, of course, was log driving in the rivers uh, on the on the Exploits River, and in a lot of cases in Newfoundland, uh, there's many power dams. Some of them are small. And in some cases, uh, they're it's a very they're they're done at a very large scale. 
Uh, so uh, I guess we're dealing with uh, uh, we're, we're we're dealing with the, the natural obstructions, which w w in most cases would be uh, would be falls, waterfalls, and we're dealing then with uh, to to mitigate the man-made obstructions. And in most cases, uh, this would tend to be uh, uh, either power dams or dams that were installed for. Uh, for, for moving wood downstream to uh, um, to, to, uh, to certain facilities, um, one one thing that's not mentioned very much, and I and I and I'm going to dwell on that a little bit too later on here, uh, and that's sa safe passage downstream uh, when we're dealing with Atlantic salmon or anything any fish that's migrating in and out. Sometimes we're concentrating on on moving them, moving them upstream, and then we we sort of uh, forget that uh, part of their journey is downstream, whether it's to kilt from the year before, uh, or uh, in the, in most cases uh, the smolt. And uh, uh, in our particular river system, I mean, we're probably looking at uh, a one million salmon smolt that run that moves down river certain through certain sections. So this became uh, this became very very important to us. Because uh, it's the old thing. If you don't get that smolt out alive, then uh, don't expect it to come back next year uh, as as an adult uh, as an adult salmon. Um, to look, we're we're looking at the different types of of upstream. First of all, fish passage, and uh, uh, I'm saying I'm saying here blasting or jack jack hammering, uh, and of course what we're uh, this is pretty natural. It's good for smaller projects, and basically, I mean, if you had a six or eight foot jump, uh, you could, uh, uh, with some uh, good blasting technicians who could focus on on actually taking out certain pieces, they could actually form a fishway uh, in several pools in the thing. And and uh, the, the old jackhammer, where you just get in and you you beat up part of the rock to create these different pools. Uh, that's certainly been used over the years. Uh, stream diversion around obstructions. Uh, this is not so popular because uh, it's very difficult to build a stream. But in some cases, I mean, it's it's just a, a runabout. Uh, we'll call it uh, around an obstruction, and, and then the, I mean, the fish are on their merry way. Um, We've also uh, like wears in stream to reduce uh, the height uh, differential. Uh, now Todd did mention the, 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 the riffle billing. Well, in a lot of cases, it's the riffle billing done, but done with construction. So if you've got an eight-foot falls that you wanted to uh, uh, across a smaller section, and you you figure that you would like to bring it down to a two-foot, uh, then I mean, you'd go from the eight down to six, down to four, and down to two. Uh, and again, these would be in-stream wears, uh, similar to what Todd referred to there as the, the riffle billing. Uh, and, and that certainly would, uh, and, and the idea is that uh, uh, the fish can manage two feet, and they can manage two feet three times, and that puts them at the top of uh, uh, the top of the falls. Uh, and then, of course, the most expensive, and uh, uh, and you will see a lot of in in, in Newfoundland, are, are the slots or, or the weir fishways around obstructions. Uh, the the fishway at the at the Grand Falls, and I, and I am going to show you a few pictures here when if we can get them, pick them out of the video. But the fishway at, at the Grand Falls uh, is about 500 feet long, and it is a it is a slot fishway, uh, and uh, that will take the fish from the bottom. From the bottom off the falls, and the falls is, is is running around 75 or 80 feet. So you're taking fish from the bottom off the falls, and through a series of of uh, slots uh, uh, and pools, and you're exiting the fish back into the river at the top of the falls. And like you mentioned, uh, there uh, in this particular case here at the Grand Falls is about 500 uh, there's about 500 feet of fishway. Basically, a man-made, person-made, to be politically correct, um, uh, uh, runabout around around the falls, and then there's then there's the, uh, another another type that we have we have used, and uh, and it's a combined pool and uh, and mechanical heist. and basically, the first part is like a traditional fishway, and then what you what you get is the last pool in that fishway. Uh, there's there's a, a I'll call it a hopper and a brailler system. It's basically a cage with two or three feet of water in the bottom. The fish don't realize that they're going in there. Then when the fish are in there, uh, they are mechanically mechanically lift up 
and over across down the other side of the dam and then the fish the thing would open and the fish would go on uh, go on their merry way say criti critical issues with uh, critical issues with, with fishways uh, if you were to uh, whichever ones you're using and again uh, Todd mentioned it, and it is all to do with fish passage, and that's maintaining maintaining the proper levels of flow. And this may be true uh, true two ways because low flow, no water, fish like water. High flow, then of course, uh, then the velocity of that, that flow may be too much uh, to uh, to uh, permit the fish to get through. So there has to be some you need to need some control of uh, of your flow. This is in a fishway, I'll say in a concrete or wooden fishway. Uh, this is usually accomplished by using stop logs. And I meant you, 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 uh, when the water drops down low, you remove another stop log, which permits more water to go down. During high periods of flow, then of course you add to the stop logs, and uh, that would uh, that would certainly bring the flows down. And in a lot of cases, on, on the bigger fishways, uh, mechanical gates are used. Uh, so uh, uh, and these, some can be electric uh, operated, and others I mean, are just manual gates uh, to control the flows down through these fishways. Uh, another critical issue, uh, I think, with the with the uh, is attraction flows uh, to do, to direct fish to the passage section and away from the, away from the obstructions, and and this is uh, uh, I've seen some designs in fishways and you know the, the amount of fish amount of water excuse me that you put down a fishway is is not that great because it's a series of restricted flows the the problem then is how do you entice the fish away from uh your obstruction say a falls and how do you tell them how do you show them the way and this is usually accomplished uh by using attraction flows Adding more water right at the entrance to a fishway uh, and fixes that problem. So it's it's uh, fish usually will go to the greater flow. So it's so the, the traction you've got to get them get them over to use these particular things. Uh, the, the other critical issue I think is that is and I call it bioengineering, and that you you have you need people that uh, and are usually people that's got an engineering background, uh, but also as some experience in fish behavior, and this is dealing with you know the rise and run ratio. Uh, you can't build you can't build a, a, a water slide for fish, but you certainly can uh, uh, you know the restricted flow, the size of the pools, you know, and and, and the, the overall behavior, uh, the overall behavior of of the fish. Let's see here. Uh, well, what are what are the benefits of uh, of fishways? Uh, you know, would you you know now you've 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 got a falls, you've got an obstruction, you've got a dam, and so you so you have you, you have to build a fishway. So what what's the benefits of of it all? Because you you wouldn't build a fishway just for the sake of building a fishway, but when it's there, um, uh, and of course the first big one in our case uh, was to access new habitat. And I did mention that uh, uh, we went from 12, 1,300 fish up to 50,000 adult fish because we've opened up 90% uh, of the exploits watershed. 10% was accessible naturally or, or semi-naturally, uh, but by opening up the 90, 90 to 95 percent actually of new habitat, that's where we where we uh, uh, accomplished our, uh, our our stock. Um, then we get the ability to do stock assessment, and uh, and we're looking at counting. And I'll show you a few pictures of this later on, here hopefully. Uh, we, we know we count three times on the Exploits River. There's a, the Bishop Falls Fishway is first when the fish come into the river, and uh, by using underwater cameras, uh, we, we know uh, we, we'll record every fish that comes in through, and we will count physically count every fish. Uh, we can do that because every fish that's going past that dam has to go through this uh, eight-foot uh, fishway, and it gives us the ability to do that. Then we count further at Grand Falls, where where is the dam, and then we count at Red Indian Lake, which is mechanical ice. Uh, so not only do, not only do we know at a very very cheap cost, no fences or anything like this, but we do know exactly the levels of our stock, and that don't only benefit this river but it's used then as an index 
for uh, for other areas that's around and other uh, other rivers and other stocks. Um, and I say the ease of removals removals for tagging. And rather than dealing with uh, a river that's uh, in some points in uh, it's probably a thousand feet across, uh, probably and even more in some areas, we're dealing with uh, removals in an eight-foot piece of fishway. And this gives us the ability to do uh, telemetry work, uh, whether it's uh, just, just a visible tag or uh, get into uh, it, all kinds of things. And the other ability too, rather than have to go out and angle or net fish to do some biological sampling, uh, we have the ability to uh, easy removal uh, from, from these fish. <clears throat> uh, just to one second here, please. Yeah, just just to give you an idea on the Exploits River, and these are the major fishways, and these are from the mouth of the river as we proceed up uh, upstream. And and what you'll see what you'll see is is the first part of when this Bishop Falls Fishway. It's it's a hydro it's a hydro dam plus it's a falls, and there's a major fishway there. Camp One Fishway is over a natural falls. The Grand Falls Fishway is over the Grand Falls. But in true, in true that, then there's in-stream weirs, and that's over a minor falls. And then, then there's the Grand Falls Fishway through the Hydro Dam. So as you can see, there's a, there's a fair bit of fish passage used there. Uh, as we move upstream, it's only three miles from the, from the Grand Falls Fishway. It's the Goodyear's Dam Fishway. Uh, up further up into the system, uh, we have the, the North Twin Lake Dam. Again, this was there's not for power, but it was uh, dam more so for driving wood, and uh, and those dams have remained in there. There's uh, North North Twin Lake, same thing, and like I mentioned, there at Red Indian Lake. Red Indian Lake is about 35 miles long, and uh, uh, the and the, the the thing itself is about 75, 80 feet high. And this was used by a combination of uh, uh, of pools and then a mechanical ice that would actually uh, actually bring uh, bring the fish uh, over. Let's see here now. Uh, downstream passage. Uh, how's our time going? Uh, downstream passage, uh, uh, like I mentioned, for for the smolt um, uh, and kelt. I mean, it's very important to us because we have. We have power developments. Uh, I think there's about uh, six power developments, some small, some large, some very large, on the Exploits River. What we've done, I mentioned at Red Indian Lake, uh, our, our downstream fish passage there is the old log driving sluice uh, that's, that haven't been used now for 20, 25 years for a log driving sluice for the logs coming out of the lake. And of course, uh, smolt, the salmon smolt, are surface swimmers, and this has worked perfect for us. It's uh, something that we've taken over from the older days, I'll say, old, old technology, and it works with us perfect to get the smolt and the kilt out of Red Indian Lake. Uh, the, Grand Falls, uh, the Grand Falls Power Canal, uh, again, that's a power development. It's a, it's a louver system. And I won't get into that much now, because when I bring in, i got a few, uh, few diagrams there. And, uh, and the Grand Falls Power Canal, we find that kelp stray in there. Uh, they do have access to go down the river, but they tend to stray in there. And then uh, every spring, we actually go in uh, with Caitlin Sains, uh, remove these fish, and sometimes it's six or 7,000 fish that, uh, that we get out of there. And then back at the Bishop Falls Power Intake, uh, it's, uh, it's for smolt. Uh, it's for smolt and, and kelp coming out of that, too. Uh, I do have a whole bunch of pictures here. Let me get into, let's see here. No, oh, that's not the one I'm looking for. Uh, okay. Have we got this up on the screen there now? I'm you. Yep. I see it on the screen, yep. Yep. Okay. 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 My 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 okay. Um, your voice okay. is is going quite choppy again. With me, Okay. 
Okay, this is the one that's don't look like it wants to do what I want to do. Okay, are you seeing picture there of the Grand Falls? You can imagine that. Uh, um, okay, I just want to find you there. Little message. Uh, okay, your your voice is coming through quite choppy again, okay, Fred. I don't know if there's an um, interference this is the with the video. Falls. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me let me move this along for a little while. Uh, there will be videos all there. Uh, yeah. Let's just see here. Let's just bear with me. Uh, there's a few here I'd like to show, and I think I see my I see my cursor moving on quite, uh, quite crazy here now. So that may be where the interference coming from. Uh, this is this is that where we've actually put in some under under our viewing. Uh, I'm longer, I think I, I think this may be not doing uh, what I wanted to do. Hang on. Hi, Fred. I, I, unfortunately, I don't think this is working. Your voice. We're not really seeing. Um, the video is moving quite choppy, and your voice is not coming through. Okay, so there must be some. Okay, what I'm going to do? I'm going to. Uh, okay, uh, are you hearing me good now? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, we must be getting some interference with. Uh, we must be getting some interference with that. Uh, it's, it's too bad because we weren't getting it. Uh, we never got it on our dry run there, right? Uh, my cursor is still doing a whole bunch of jumping, so I don't know if there's some interference coming through there. But okay. what I can, I can post the video, the full video online on our website um, okay. after the presentation is over. Okay, our, our time is getting a little short there too now, uh, and uh, and like Darla said, uh, the the full video it's it's one that's done by the power company, so I mean, they got their little slant on it. Uh, it runs about nine or ten minutes, uh, but it it is excellent, very high quality, and it will give you some idea of uh, of large fishways and fish passage. Uh, we'll we'll have to leave it at that. Uh, it's too bad because there was a a good. Uh, a good section here, and if you go in there particularly, spend some time at looking at the downstream louver system that's located uh, around the power canal. It's very high tech, uh, the, the latest uh, uh, technology, I guess, that's out there to uh, get fish away from, uh, say, power structures and all that. And other than that, I guess uh, we can't get that there. Uh, uh, and I know our time is slipping away. Well, we can certainly throw it right open to uh, questions. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much, Fred. That was excellent. Um, so we will, as Fred said, open the floor to questions for both Fred and Todd. So you can either use um, your go-to panel to type in your questions. You can raise your hand so that we can unmute you. Or you can always send me <coughs> your question via email, and we'll read it out loud. Uh, there was a couple questions. I've just got to find my window here. Oh, okay. There's some people that have typed questions, so I'll read them out. Um, so first off, Bruce Walker asks, um, maybe I'll undo Todd. Yeah, I'll unmute Todd as well. Um, do you find baffled culverts frequently accumulate sediment within them, interfering with fish, pa fish passage? In my work in streams, the high bed load transport baffle notches frequently plug with rocks. Uh, I have not experienced that on, on Prince Edward Island. We have experienced uh, not rocks, but uh, woody debris often uh, will get, uh, will get uh, plugged up in some of these culverts or beavers will uh, get in there and make a mess. And it could be just a function of the type of substrate that we have on, on PEI. It tends to be fairly small uh, substrate, small stones, which I suspect would easily fit through the, uh, the culvert slots. Uh, uh, through the uh, the baffle slot, so I have not experienced uh, that. <laughs> on PEI. 
Okay, next question we've got. Some people can raise their hands if they want me to um, unmute them. Lots of people are typing them in. But Okay, next question is also Bruce Walker. In the Exploits River, Newfoundland, was there any natural fish, fish passage at Grand Falls or Bishop Falls prior to construction of the fish ladders? Uh, no, there, uh, there, there wasn't any. It was pretty well, uh, uh, that was Deanna to run. Uh, and uh, back uh, in, in 1960s, uh, there was a fishway built around Bishop Falls, and uh, the main reason that was done was because they uh, they took a, another uh, little brook or oh, fair size brook or rivers, and uh, they they put a power dam on it back in back in the late 50s. And what they did then was take all the fish from that and transfer them to the Exploits River, uh, and that. And with that, they had to build a dam true to true to Bishop Falls. Uh, at Grand Falls, it was a total uh, total uh, uh, obstruction, and there there wasn't any salmon present above. Okay, I've got two more that I'll read out, and then Joshua Royt has his uh, hand raised, so I'll unmute him in a second. Um, okay, this is from Will Brunner. Uh, I think this is more of a question for Todd. Do you or others in PEI have any trouble working with the owners of culverts when you complete restoration, i.e. putting substrate in culverts, riffles, etc.? Uh, most of the culvert work that we that we do are actually government uh, culverts, uh, basically because they have a budget actually to do the work. Uh, if you're if you're dealing with private landowners, it's at a whole other ball of wax uh, because often the, uh, the private landowners uh, will not have a budget uh, in place to uh, you know to do the re to the re do the remediation work and often the, the watershed groups will have to go and source all or part of the uh, of the funding uh, to replace those culverts which makes it a little little more cumbersome um, and what was the last part of the question oh I just erased it um, okay yeah sorry <laughs> I think just in I'm terms sorry, of, yeah, I think it was just in terms of, of dealing with private owners. Right, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was I was just gonna go on to the next question, but if you have more to add that. No, I don't, no. Okay. okay, we've got one more from Santa Kavanaugh. If uh, if Will, if you have more to add to that, you can just type the question back in again. Um, okay, this is <coughs> Santa Kavanaugh. For Todd Dupuy, is there a guide to culvert design for fish fish passage that you recommend? There are, yeah, I can tell you, there are uh, a number of publications. Uh, I know that the state of Maine has a has a pretty good one, and I know that I can tell you now that Fishers and Oceans Canada has one that has not been released yet, although it was written in 2003, and for some reason it hasn't made final edits. I have read it. Uh, I just recently uh, wrote a watershed restoration manual for PEI, and and uh, you know one chapter is on culverts, and I was able to. Uh, get my hands on the DFO one, which I thought was a fabulous publication, but unfortunately is not available yet um, uh, to the public, even though it was written in 2003. Those are the two best best ones that I see, but there are guidelines, uh, you know, both uh, usually fisheries oceans do have guidelines in place, although not using this publication, and often uh, provinces will have uh, certain guidelines for contractors that are replacing culverts uh, that they should follow in order to uh, provide fish passage. But if you want to send me a note, uh, directly, uh, perhaps I can set you up with uh, what I think is one of the better uh, publications. As a plug from, this is Michelle from CRI talking, um, as a plug for CRI, we actually have on our website um, Bob Newbery's Stream Restoration Manual. He, he talks a little bit about, he has some case studies in there and he's got quite a few of them dealt with fish passage as well and, uh, and we run a stream restoration course each year. This year it's going to be in Penticton, BC, but last year we had it in Fundy National Park, so uh, most of his, yeah, Bob, most of his Bob, books are about um, fish fish movement. That's right, Bob. Uh, Bob is one of the sort of the leaders in the in the in the country. In fact, any any uh, the, the hydrology training that I had came from Bob Newberry. So yeah. he's he's a big fan of soft engineering, creating these ripple structures to get fish up through these uh, culverts and other systems. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so now. Sorry, go ahead. Will, sorry, I remember what you said. Placing rocks, I think, in culverts. I have not done that. I mean, I did show a picture of placing boulders 
uh, within a round culver to uh, to create some roughness and, and breaks in the current. I have not done that, but I understand that it can work if, it, if it's designed properly. I have been involved in putting ra baffles in, in place, so wooden timber baffles, but not involved in putting stones within culverts, so I don't have much experience there. He did send a follow-up note as well. He said, we've just had issues with impacting the structure and design of the culvert as to potentially put risk on the structure of the road above. Or the structure or and that is an issue. You have to remember that often these structures are designed uh, hydraulically uh, to allow the one in 50 year rain event. Uh, so they have a certain capacity, uh, but you have to be cognizant. If you're putting st stuff in that culvert, you're, you're often you're reducing the capacity of that culvert uh, to pass water. And it might be better conditions for fish passage, but it might reduce its capacity to handle these big rain events. So. You, know, you really have to do some engineering and some calculations to make sure that you do not put undue stress on these structures that are only designed for one to 50 year rain events. Most of the structures today in most of the regions of Canada, uh, they should be putting the one in 100 in structures in, so one in 100 year rain events, which are quite a bit bigger, and therefore you'd have some more flexibility uh, with respect to putting uh, rocks and or baffles in place uh, in those particular structures. Okay, now I'm going to unmute Josh Royt, and um, you can go ahead and ask your question. Sure, thanks. This is for Todd again. It has to do with those weirs to back water, um, those those hung culverts. Um, many times the, the culverts are hung because they're undersized anyway, so it, it makes it uh, difficult for the fish, I imagine, in the culvert. But I, I love the idea of, of putting in several ripples. Um, but I'm just wondering in terms of the relative cost of doing that, uh, if you needed to... You mentioned it for a, a couple of feet, it looked like, but I'm wondering if you have an idea of the relative cost for getting big enough rocks and engineering so they, it looks like they need to interlock so they can take the ice flow, especially out of a lake, where if you dropped lake level, it would be particularly bad for public relations with the lake camp owners. Uh, so do, do you have design standards for, for how to build those and the size of rocks in different size water sets? Yeah, I do, and, I, and I'm using, uh, again, going back to Bob Newberry's publication, uh, using his, his uh, formulas, uh, tractor force formulas to size the rock, and I use, the, what I use what's called a fudge factor for the Army Corps of Engineers to make them half as big again. So there, you, there is a formula that, that, that you use, and it's based on the slope of the stream and the, and the height of the banks, and that'll give you a sort of the, uh, the, uh, the energy that you would expect in that particular system and you must size the rocks to that to make sure that they don't move. So you, you've got big boulders in place that they're designed not to move and then you have to backfill, if you said, with the smaller stones to make sure the water is going up and over the structure as opposed to going through the structure or else you may be causing some fish right. and problems. And it is the anchor stone that holds the whole structure in place. But if you want to go, you know, go to the Newberry uh, publication that uh, Michelle had uh, talked about earlier, he's a, he's a master with respect to what size of stone you uh, you should use in these particular systems. And uh, cost-wise, they are, uh, they certainly, uh, the Department of Transportation, which who I deal with on PEI, they love them because they're a lot more cheaper to, it's a lot cheaper to build these riffle structures than it is to replace the culvert. And and if you can get fish through the culvert, you know, it's one thing to get any fish up to the lip of the culvert, but uh, you have to ensure that the fish are going to get through the culvert. Uh, but it's it's always it's always cheaper uh, in their mind, and I built probably eight or ten of these uh, cheaper to build these ripple structures than it is to replace the culvert. Uh, often the culvert is not at a point where it's collapsing, and they did, they really don't want to re replace it unless they have to. And uh, and often it is it is the Department of Transportation that pays for it. You know, I do the design work, I, I'm there and, and doing the work on, but they pay for the heavy machinery and get the stone in place. And the cost associated really depends on, you know, how far you have to truck the rock and how you know, how the access is, is at that particular spot. But that one I showed you, uh, there was two structures with a, with a sort of a square culvert. That was about $20,000, I think, uh, we, we built, and that's certainly a lot cheaper than replacing that culvert. And Helen, great. Thank you. You're welcome. So I don't see any more questions or hands raised right now, Darla. Okay. Uh, well, thank you both for giving the presentation. Um, they were absolutely excellent, really informative, and um, I, I think everyone got a lot out of them. Um, I'd just like to remind everybody that our next webinar series will be on March 20th. Chris Hunter of Habitat Unlimited in Nova Scotia will be speaking about stream restoration techniques. And the registration links for that 
uh, webinar is, are available on our website and on CRI's website as well. So and another reminder that this is going to be the last presentation in this, our first year of the pilot webinar series, but we are planning on hosting a second series starting in the fall. So we're very eager to have suggestions for either topics or speakers, um, and Michelle or I would both appreciate um, any, any suggestions that anyone might have. You can send those along to us by email. So thank you everyone for participating today, and I will hope to see you on future webinars. Thanks, Darla. Thanks, everyone.